All right, welcome back to another video from Lizard Landscapes. We've got a mountain lake diorama. So this is of a, a very well-known lake in Canada. Leave me a comment if you've ever been to this actual location. So this is a fairly simple, I would say beginner leaning towards intermediate project. So sit back and relax and enjoy watching me make this diorama. So usually I start off with a sketch. This is that sketch that I had in the beginning. You want to be near an open window because we're going to be using some hot wires from the hot wire foam factory. And you want to make sure that you have one of these professional dust masks. So knowing that I was going to have this reflection that I wanted I uh, made sure that you can use like something, a piece of plastic or a mirror to try to figure out how much of the lake you need to be able to have enough of a reflection for the mountain. So measuring out some XPS polystyrene using this straight wire to cut those out. So I've got a certain length and width in the base and I'm just going to trace around that to create two more pieces like that. So this is the base. I'm going to hold all of this together with pins. So I'm doing that just so that I can change my mind if need be later without having to rip apart all of the glue. So drawing out the design of the lake and then having it go down into that uh, lake portion. So the lake ended up being like a little over three inches deep, but I'll show later as to how I saved on resin with that idea. Building up the landscape towards the back left there, got a uh, piece that aligns with the shape of the lake and a trace around that to get an exact duplicate. Got those, gonna hold those together with some pins and gonna take the flexible wire and start sculpting that, trying to uh, sculpt out the basic uh, shape of that mountain range. So realized that the project was a little bit too small. I needed some extra girth uh, on the back there to be able to do those mountains effectively. So extended the back with those two extra pieces. And I've got that piece that winds up being the uh, hill of trees on the right. And going to just using a marker, trying to all the while looking at reference photos of this lake and mountain range as to where I need to cut with the hot wire. So gouging out some pieces to create some depth can go back and forth with the hot wire or a knife to, uh, to try to get a realistic look of that mountain range. So that is how it's looking. I ended up extending the height of that, the back of the mountain range. So time to glue all of this together. So remove the pins and uh, take all of these apart and start adding some glue. So all of these materials will be listed in uh, the description below the video. So gluing on these sections and uh, marked it with a black marker to uh, be able to realize or remember where I had placed all of these pieces. So those are those extensions of that mountain range. and cutting out the uh, lake portion. So what I did was I tried to conserve on resin. So in trying to be your poor man's guide to diorama building, um, cutting out or trying to cut out around a quarter inch all the way around depth wise and with it being cut 
those two sections uh, vertically, uh, trying to cut out a quarter inch, wound up being a little bit more than that, but just so that most of the lake is actually taken up with the, uh, the styrofoam, doing an underpainting of that blue color. Um, but I think I saved quite a bit on resin. I ended up using around nine ounces and I think if I hadn't done this, it would have been over 20 if I had carved out that entire lake area. But of course you can carve out even, you know, smaller of an area, one eighth of an inch, maybe to save on even more resin. And then carving out that back section that winds around that hill of trees and using the flexible hot wire to carve out the top section of that uh, lake area. So we ended up going a little bit deeper than a quarter of an inch. It's difficult to kind of judge where you're, you're cutting and how deep you're going. So in doing all that, repairing with some glue, some areas that uh, don't look uh, uniform to everything else. So putting in some glue here and there to uh, cover up some of the mistakes I made. And thought that this sharp edge needed to be removed. So taking a razor blade and kind of rounding out that edge of the styrofoam there. So here's a, an idea of how to extend the mountain range. So in looking at the reference photos, realized I needed to have that extend a little bit, didn't quite look right. So using kind of a, like a two dimensional representation of that mountain, gluing that on there and then filling in the rest with glue, the backside that is. And so with every project I do, there seems to be all these gaps that uh, are produced in gluing all of these pieces together. So using a really thin piece of that same polystyrene and just wedging it in there and then cutting the excess away with a razor blade. And got a little small piece here to try to extend some of that mountain range and then using that in combination with that glue, same glue it took to uh, glue everything together, all of those pieces. So you can do that to build up some of the landscape, but uh, also uh, taking a tool and creating texture onto that glue before it dries. But I would say for the most part, the texture that you see in that mountain range was created uh, with a combination of my fingernail and a razor blade and a couple of other dull tools. But you can take your fingernail and really just, with this type of polystyrene, with the EPS it doesn't work as well, but with the XPS it uh, really works well to uh, use your fingernail or other tools to create texture. So getting into some really fine detail there. And then going back in with a razor blade. And then taking out some bigger chunks here and there really creates some depth to uh, take out some chunks here and there. And then doing this to show that you really could just do this in a really quick way, kind of doing some speed texturizing with my fingernail, kind of randomly, almost mindlessly going along. And as long as you're following the lay of the land and how it flows in looking at the reference photos, you should be fine. You can also take a uh, soft wire brush and kind of press that into certain areas of the landscape, kind of making sure that it is uneven might not be uh, perceivable on video, but in person creates a nice texture. And then creating some texture, creating those layers of the earth uh, in those side areas. So using either your fingernail or a tool, I think with the backside using a tool here, just to create the suggestion of layers in the, the earth. So be sure and check out this intermission.
All right, time for another intermission. This is where I go completely off topic and try to motivate those who haven't found God yet to start searching. There are several explanations I've heard of why the Bible exists or how it came to be. One is that it was written down as a lie, a hoax meant to deceive or lure people into many things, such as giving away their money. Another is that it's a myth, never meant to be taken seriously or literally. Another is obviously that it's the truth, which is what I believe. Among non-believers, I would say the most popular theory is that it was a lie, or is a lie. The issue I have with that is that you would have to believe that a liar sat down and came up with scriptures like 1 John 3.13, which says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Or Matthew 10.22, which says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He's talking about Jesus. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Or Matthew 5.11-12, through 12, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake talking about Jesus there. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Or, John 15, 18 through 19, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Or, Matthew 24, 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. The me in that sentence is Jesus. Talking about Christians. These are all things potentially going to happen to believers in Christ. Do any of those scriptures sound like someone trying to entice or tempt you, tempting someone into joining their organization? Why would a liar think that that was something that was going to motivate someone to join a group or a belief system? Particularly, scriptures like Matthew 24, 9, where it says you will be persecuted and put to death. To me, it doesn't line up with human nature, especially someone trying to purposefully deceive others. Sound like ideas from a liar, or does it sound more like God inspiring men to write down ideas they never would have come up with on their own? The point of these videos is really to motivate you to do your own research and to ultimately realize that this topic is worthy of your time. Check out all of the amazing testimonies online of people who have been to heaven and hell and whose lives have been transformed from following Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. All right, so time to start the painting process. So I've got a thinned out, watered down, black acrylic paint, and I'm going to cover most of this project. I'm not going to cover the lake because there was really no reason to cover that it's just a solid blue aqua color but you can really see the detail of the of what I had uh, uh, applied to that XPS foam there but all of that black paint will get into those cracks and so uh, dry brushing some uh, very dark brown over top of uh, all of these uh, areas of the mountain range so using a whole bunch of different colors going back and forth uh, with lighter colors, earthy colors. So, of course, using the reference photos as a guide as to what colors you should be applying. And decided to use some uh, kind of burnt orange clay-like color. You see this in the end uh, product with being able to apply a complementary color to that Blue Lake color. But adding some very light highlights here and there, knowing at some point I'm going to be adding some snow. But so starting the process of adding the uh, that really interesting teal sort of creamy color that this actual site does have has something to do with the glaciers 
So if you know what that is, leave me a comment. But painting that right up to uh, the water line. And uh, using a sandstone color, decided to do, there's just, when you look at the reference photos of this actual site, there's just a very subtle hint of a beach, of a progression from the watercolor to a land color. So using combination of the like sandstone land color and the aqua color, and then a, a wet clean brush to kind of blend the two together. Cause I'm using acrylic paint so this stuff uh, dries really quickly. So you kind of have to move fast here in this whole process of the goal being trying to create this natural fade between that uh, land color and the color of the water. So kind of working out of order here. This is before I even started the painting process, but showing the uh, barriers to be able to contain the resin. This is gonna be glued on top of the barriers so this is something you would find at like an office supply store, but I'm gonna uh, glue this on top of foam core. So applying some glue and then applying this, you want to have your resin curing up against something really smooth so that it is easier to remove these barriers later. And then starting the process of applying the snow, so just taking pure white acrylic paint with a really small brush and trying to get into uh, in between those ridges of the, the main mountain range. Applying a little bit of snow to the, the top as well. So here are those barriers. We uh, let those dry and I'm gonna try to figure out how to place these. So putting them flush up against uh, the sides there helps that those sides are perfectly flat. So implementing tubes of paint and I've got a, like a tub of sand there. So trying to hold those together, I even have cans of soup holding all of these barriers together. You want them uh, as flush as possible up against those barriers and then adding uh, glue. So gluing, literally gluing the barriers to the project. And then adding some of that same glue to the base. So the, the goal here is to try to not lose any resin, to try to prevent any leaks. So adding a good layer of glue. And then as a last step, applying a different type of sealant that is a water repellent sealant. And then I allowed that to dry for 72 hours. And then doing a water test. So pouring in, pouring in actual water pouring it right up to the water line and letting that sit for a while so we did not have any leaks. And then taking that, pouring that into a wide mouth bowl, catches all that water, then you can use that, pour that into a measuring device or container and gives you a much more accurate guess of how much resin you're gonna need to mix. So what I did was poured three separate one ounce layers of resin 24 hours apart from each other. Because if you notice that little reservoir in the front of the lake, rather thin, didn't have much uh, surface area, you're really with this particular resin only supposed to pour like a half inch at a time. So I used three separate pours 24 hours apart to fill up that little area. And then after that had dried, uh, measured out what I was gonna need to finish the job and pouring about three quarters of an inch right up to the water line. And then letting that sit for about a week and uh, found that these uh, plastic pieces 
kind of got stuck to the resin. But any barrier you use is going to get stuck to a certain degree. So you just need to use some muscle and, and kind of rip those off. That one didn't stick as much, but so anyway, get a little bit of a workout in uh, getting that to uh, remove. And then sometimes with the resin, I would say actually every time, there's always these little stragglers you gotta cut away with a razor blade. And painting, uh, waited to paint that hill area with the trees until after I poured the resin. So I wanted to be able to paint right up to the, the water line. So painting that, uh, just giving it a fairly good coat of green and then dry brushing that same color onto some of the mountain range because I'm going to put some uh, model railroad foliage onto that as well. And then I've got the project propped up. So I'm using gravity to my advantage, uh, applying some glue because you don't want that glue dripping down into that resin. I'm not going to have any texture on the water. I just want it to be completely clear like a mirror that's reflecting the mountain uh, so you don't want any of that glue going down into there so that glue is really um, it's not thinned down at all uh, but gluing down some model railroad foliage I think it's medium green so later I will go back and uh, apply some more traditional pine tree looking trees and then decided to put in this layer to kind of make the project pop. It's kind of a bright orange layer. This is also a complementary color of that blue lake color, that teal color. So getting that teal and orange look, whenever possible, trying to incorporate a complementary color into your project. But you could explain this color away as being like a bright layer of like red clay. Or maybe if you go even brighter than this with a little bit more red, uh, maybe it's like a layer of molten lava. But anything to uh, throw in a little bit more color and uh, to make it pop in general. So what I also did was uh, reiterate those colors in going below and above that main layer of that sort of bright orange. But not as strong. So applying some glue to those other areas where I need to apply some, some more model railroad foliage. So here's how I did the trees. I took some of that same model railroad foliage, medium green, and kind of clumped it together and glued it together and then allowed that to dry and then taking scissors cut out some shapes of uh, pine trees. So obviously tapering towards the top, create that pointy tree look. So it's really the same stuff made out of the same stuff that the base of the mountain uh, is made of, but just to give that look, because in the actual scene, in the actual location, there are, uh, it's covered with pine trees. So taking a pin with some uh, white acrylic paint to try to suggest a water line and then taking a clean pen and kind of removing uh, most of that water line just so that the effect is really subtle. And you can see the benefit of doing that layer of the sandstone color fade from uh, the blue color to the sandstone. It's very subtle, uh, but it definitely kind of sits that back there. So there you have it. Lake Mountain Diorama. So be sure to check out the rest of the channel. Subscribe and like this video, comment. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.